thank you, Alan, and thank you to the award committee for, for choosing me to give this talk today. You know, this is our annual scientific meeting, but, but truthfully, this is a clinical talk, and that fits perfectly because I am a clinician by choice. In fact, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my life, so much so that I had no second backup plan if I didn't get into medical school. And it was during medical school that I actually fell in love with neurology, and, and during medical school, believe it or not, that I fell in love with the practice of headache medicine, despite all the stares I got from my, my, my other students. And in fact, headache medicine was actually not a term that was even coined when I was in medical school, but it was something that, that I always thought that I wanted to do. <clears throat> and in fact, following my fellowship at Montefiore, I had no doubt that I had chosen the, the, the correct career path for myself. I was then, like I am now, intrigued by the challenges of headache medicine, and I, and I assume like most of you in this, in this office, I enjoy sorting out the puzzles when dealing with a patient in front of me with, with, a, with, with a headache. I find it challenging, at times unfortunately I find it frustrating, but invariably I find it to be a rewarding experience. You know what mo many of you here probably don't even realize is that when I was doing my, my neurology residency and when I was doing my fellowship, I discovered something about myself, and that was how much I really enjoyed the academ academia, the academic pursuit of, of neurology. And when I discussed it with my then chairman, Dr. Herb Schaumburg, and the director of my residency training program, who ultimately became my mentor, Dr. Richard Lipton, they were unsure whether that would be the correct career choice for me. And they, they based it, at least they told me, they based it not on my knowledge base, not on my ability to do hard work or to do research, but rather they based it on the car that I was driving during my residency. And I actually dug up this picture, a picture about 30 years old of me standing in front of the BMW 3 Series that I drove during my residency. And um, in retrospect, I think I might have been the first victim of automotive profiling. <laughs> and, and as I look at that picture, I can tell you I really miss that car. But not nearly as much as I miss my hair. <laughs> And unfortunately, I, I think I still have that shirt. <laughs> anyway, when, when trying to choose a, a, a topic for, for this lecture, I, I found it to be a rather daunting experience. How do you pick a, a talk that, that, that honors the legacy of one of the best clinicians ever in headache medicine? I thought about picking a talk that dealt with a specific clinical issue. I thought also perhaps I should talk about a current problem in healthcare, or perhaps like like prior past presidents, I thought perhaps I should talk about a future issue that will, that will affect us in, in this field. I was so confused about what I should speak, uh, speak about, I actually reached out to several of my colleagues, several of the past presidents, and asked for their advice. And in the end, I actually rejected all of their, their suggestions to come up with one of my own, which we'll see shortly. I thought at first about talking about the problems we're all currently facing in healthcare, and if you've been in healthcare for many years, you, you know there's definitely been a sea change over the last decade or so. It's become an epic battle just documenting what we need to document and, and meeting the meaningful use. We've been subjected to constant oversight both within and, and outside of our, our own institutions, from, from our employers, from the insurance providers, constant governmental oversight. For those of you in this long enough, you've seen that we've gradually had an erosion of our, uh, of our independence. We've lost a sense of control. And, and more often than not, we've lost our ability to, what, to do what we think is best for our patients. And that led me to think that perhaps I should speak about a problem that's so common, the, the, the issue of burnout. You can't read in the lay press, you can't read in the medical journals without coming up about, about this issue. I can't walk through the corridors of my own institution without hearing people complain about how they feel so burnt out. And in fact, within my own practice, two of my young, up-and-coming, rising stars, actually, actually at this point in my career, everybody seems to be a young, up-and-coming, rising star. Um, you couldn't help, they, they left, they become so disenfranchised by, by what's happening in, in medicine in New York that they've actually left the practice looking for, for greener, for greener pastures, and clearly, what we do, headache medicine is ripe for burnout. Dawn told us about that yesterday and reviewed Randy Evans' work. It's demanding both intellectually, it's demanding emotionally, 
our own colleagues, not, not within this organization, but, but, but colleagues in, in, in other fields, how often have you heard them say to you, I don't know how you do this every day, or I'm happy you do this because God knows I sure don't want to do something like that. But the more I, I thought about it, I can empathize with it, but it, it, it's not real to me. I still believe that we can make a difference for, for our patients, for, for our patients' families, and for our profession as well. And the more I thought about it, and in retrospect, I'm happy I didn't pick this choice because I couldn't have done it the justice that, that Dawn did yesterday. The more I thought about it, I realized that these challenges more bum me out than they actually burn me out. And that got me thinking again, what is it in healthcare today that I'm the most frustrated? And it's not the day-to-day -day struggles of my practice. They annoy me, but they don't frustrate me to that degree. It's the struggles that I face trying to help those who are struggling with migraine. And if you ask yourself, why is that? It, it's, it's complicated. So clearly it's not the most severe of the headache disorders. That dubious distinction would go to clusters or the other tags. And it's not for the most part, the most treatment resistant. You all know that feeling within 10 minutes of talking to a patient who has new daily persistent headache as you feel your, your, your stomach start to sink. And it's clearly not for the most part, the most persistent but it is the most pervasive and it has the ability to be the most disabling. And that got me to think about this topic, disabling migraine through facts, figures, and faces. And the more I thought about it, it, meant all, it met all the criteria that I was looking for in a talk. It addresses a specific clinical issue, it addresses a current problem in healthcare, and unless we take steps now to fix it, it will be a, a problem that we all have to deal with in the future. So now, finally, 10 slides into my talk. And how long have you seen someone go 10 slides before they bring up their disclosures? <coughs> Here are my disclosures, which have absolutely no relevance to the talk at hand. The only relevant disclosure I have is that I have a 23-year-old <clears throat> son, Eric, who has been suffering from daily unremitting headaches, migraines, for, for the past two and a half years following a concussion he sustained while in college. So I'm dedicating this talk to Eric. So here's what I hope to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. And I was, I'll preface this talk by saying, there is nothing in my talk that is new to anybody here in the, in the audience. I'm not here to teach you anything. What I hope at the end of the talk is that you will look at this with a fresh set of eyes. So I hope to cover how migraine is disabling, who exactly is disabled by migraine, and finally, what can we do as a group to disable migraine? So first, let's start with how is migraine disabling? The problem is huge. If you look at the epidemiologic data, it affects more than a billion people in the world. It affects more than 38 million of us here in, in the United States. That translates to about 13% of all adults, 8% of children and adolescents. It has a lifetime prevalence of nearly 20%. And 3% of our population suffer from the chronic form of this disease. It affects people early in their lives, typically beginning before age 35, typically affecting them in, in their peak productive years between 25 and 50. But quite frankly, this doesn't do it justice. And, and with all due respect to my epidemiologic colleagues, including my mentor, um, it's just numbers on a page. It doesn't really tug at the heartstrings. It doesn't really convey what migraine does. And to try and put it into a better perspective, I actually went out and reached out to some of my patients and asked them to use their own words to explain how their lives are affected by migraine. So here we have Ashley, and Ashley's words don't project as well as they should, so I will read them to you, but the sentiment should, should resonate with all of you. Ashley tells us, I experienced my first migraine at age 10. Attacks became more frequent and severe over time and are difficult to treat and nearly impossible to prevent. They take a huge toll on relationships with family and friends. I miss important events and have been hospitalized many times. I medically withdrew from school. Now 23 and in medical school, I cannot remember a day that I wasn't in pain. I have challenges and hardships that others don't. My journey towards becoming a doctor will be an uphill battle. Now that, I think, is pointed. The World Health Organization tells us that migraine is the third most common and sixth most disabling disease on the planet. Furthermore, the WHO 
tells us that a day lived with migraine is as disabling as a day lived with dementia, hydroplegia, or acute psychosis, and that migraine is more disabling than blindness, angina, or paraplegia. Again, just words on a page. If you ask a patient what migraine does to them, they put it in, in, in more succinct terms. Rob tells us that, imagine all the people, possessions, and activities you love the most in life being right in front of you, but being in so much pain that you can't reach out to grab them. That's how my migraines have made me feel every single day for the better part of the last decade. I've missed so many crucial days at school, so many paying hours at work, and so much leisure time with my friends and family, all because I have this disease and it controls me like a puppet. So who exactly is burdened by migraine? Well, well clearly the patient but also their families, their employer, assuming that they can have gainful employment, and the entire healthcare system. Looking at data from, from a recent data from the Cameo study, we see how migraine tears at the very fabric of the, of the family. It interferes with the spouse, the child, and the affected individual as well. <clears throat> Looking at data from the Cameo study, we see that it causes stress in the lives of, 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 their, of the interaction, even when the patient doesn't have a migraine. A third of the spouses of those with episodic migraine, a half of the spouses of those with the chronic form of this disease report, avoiding the person with migraine when they're afflicted with an attack. People with migraine and their spouses reported that the spouse was more demanding on the children because of that suffers migraine. And finally, the affected individual tells us that they believe they would be better parents if they didn't suffer from migraine. Again, words on a page, powerful words, but not nearly as powerful as what Marisol tells us. And Marisol, when asked, told me, I'm a 44-year-old mom with migraines for 20 years with no effective treatment in sight. After 20 years, I am seeing a specialist who changes my medications every three months to see if any combination will alleviate the severity of the attacks. My family life depends on how I'm feeling on that particular day. If I don't have a migraine, I'm able to enjoy my family in the day. In the throes of a severe migraine, a dark, silent room will be my companion for the day or days. That sentiment is, echo is, is echoed by Abby, another one of my uh, patients, who says, daily migraines for the past eight years made me quit my career. Now as the mother of two young children, the severe pain greatly impacts my ability to care for them. My family gets a much lesser version of the person I used to be. I have less patience, I'm more irritable and constantly stressed by the chronic pain. I spend a lot of time resting instead of being with my kids. I have been on a seemingly endless search for relief and I have not yet found effective treatment and often think I never will. Migraine affects the employer as well, assuming the patient is actually able to go to work. Migraine costs the American employers about $20 billion a year in both direct and indirect cost. Not surprisingly, the chronic form of the disease affects people and, and, and extracts more of a toll than the, episodic, than the episodic form, but nonetheless, it's the same disease with different forms and extracts an enormous um, toll on our society. Men with chronic migraine cost employees about $200 more per week than episodic migraine, and the difference is about half that for, for women. We also see from, from epidemiologic data that about the lower, socio, the lower employment status, and we can see that about twice as many patients who suffer from chronic migraine than episodic migraine are occupationally disabled, 11% versus 20%, a staggering number, but again, just numbers. This young patient, Steve, tells us how it impacts his life as well. I experienced my first migraine, says Steve, at age 12. Over the next 12 years, my migraines increased in severity and frequency. I am now 24 years old and should be able to have a full-time job. Because of chronic migraine, I am unable to work or participate in daily activities and have been left stuck in a dark room. I no longer feel like I have specific attacks. I would say at this point I have a migraine for two years that just fluctuates in severity. Is it any wonder then 
that there are greater health care resource use by, the, by people who suffer from, from migraine, whether it's episodic or chronic migraine, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, or emergency department visits. Despite the scope of the, of the illness, despite the health care burden caused by the illness, our armamentarium to treat these patients remains woefully inadequate. We, there, we have, in fact, several acute treatment options, but the newest agents, those agents, the triptans, were introduced two decades ago. And they're not a panacea. They don't work for anybody, for, for everybody, I should say. <laughs> Hopefully they work for anybody. And, and, and many of the patients who were, who were candidates for these agents two decades ago have aged out and they are no longer able to receive these medications. We've had no new breakthrough classes in quite some time. Additionally, there's no new preventative agents that have been specifically developed for migraine in about half of a century. Hopefully that's going to change soon. Why is that? Well, I think part of the answer lies here in this slide that, that Bob Shapiro was kind enough to lend to me, where we're looking at the NIH funding compared to, plotted against the dailies, the, the disability adjusted life years. And as you can see, migraine is way down on that scale. So much so that if you look at the 2015 NIH funding, $241 million in funding was given for schizophrenia, while only $20 million was given for migraine. And according to this, from this data, equitable NIH migraine funding should be about 12 times higher than what it is right now, and that needs to change. Further complicating the issue is the stigma that, that, our, that our patients with migraine endure. When compared with other similar disorders, and by that I mean chronic conditions with an episodic occurrence, migraine stigma is significantly greater than it is for asthma. It's on par with epilepsy and panic disorder, and not surprisingly, those with chronic migraine are much more stigmatized than those with episodic migraine. And stigma has been correlated most strongly with the inability of the sufferer to work and, and, and with absenteeism. Why is it that, our, that these people with migraine are stigmatized? Well, there's many reasons. As you know, all too often, migraine is not considered a real medical illness. It's an invisible illness because patients look normal in between their attacks. There's no specific biomarker, at least not yet, and hopefully, hopefully the, the biorepository um, and the registry will put an end to that fairly soon. Migraine is comorbid with a number of psychiatric and psychological conditions, as Don Buse reviewed for us yesterday. And attacks are most commonly reported to be triggered by stress. So all too often, patient families, patient coworkers, unfortunately other clinicians attribute this to a psychiatric or a psych psychological condition. And migraine is not considered a life-threatening condition. So then explain to me why it's a leading cause of suicide attempt and suicide in both the civilian and military populations. Rob, another Rob, and when I put this slide together, I thought it was very appropriate that I have two patients named Rob who I interviewed because clearly migraine robs people of quite a lot in their life. But Rob told me, it is surrendering to the fact that life will never be the same and that it will always include varying degrees of pain, both mental and physical. It is dealing with the losses that are inherent with this condition. It is putting on a happy face, pretending things are okay on the outside when on the inside they are anything but. It is knowing that people without chronic pain do not understand chronic pain. It is not knowing what tomorrow will bring. It is all easier said than done. It is no way to live, yet life goes on much more powerful than any statistic I can quote to you today. And that brings me to this. Is migraine a disease or is migraine a disorder? And we need to get the message out. And David alluded to this at the opening, that there's going to be a public awareness campaign in Feb <laughs> beginning in February of 2017 to change these perceptions and, and to destigmatize migraine moving forward. The medical definition defines disease as a condition characterized by functional impairment, structural change in the presence of specific signs and symptoms, whereas a disorder is characterized by functional impairment without structural change, and that the presence of signs and symptoms is not required. I think it's clear, using the criteria we use to make the diagnosis of migraine and other conditions, 
and, and the, the, the evidence that we have that there's changes in both structure and function that we are dealing with a disease. If you ask my patients, there's not one that will tell you they're not dealing with a disease. So that's what we know. Recently, I sent out an email to several of my, my colleagues and friends and said, if there were two things that you could learn about migraine in the next year or two, what would they be? And then I followed it up with saying, I'll explain why in a few weeks. So for those of you who answered me, the few weeks are here. The, the, the answers are remarkably similar, so I tried to collate a, a, a number of them. And they range from what exactly is migraine to where in the brain does, does it actually begin? Is migraine different for different people and within the same person, does it differ between different attacks? What is the molecular switch, if any, that finally terminates at an attack? And clearly, when migraine first begins in life, are there reliable predictors to determine whose lives will be impaired and to what degree they'll be impaired? Other questions raise these, uh, raise these features. What determines the natural history of migraine? Why do some, but not every, but not all of our patients develop medication overuse in the setting of overuse medication? Why does migraine remit in some? What is the molecular mechanism that underlies the increase in frequency and persistence that happens with the transformation to chronic migraine? And also, is concussion a trigger for chronic migraine? And I think Eric would have an answer for you for that one. And then finally, at looking towards treatment answers. Which interventions modify the natural history? Is there a druggable target that prevents progression? How do we predict which treatment will work on an individual person? Wouldn't it be nice to get it right the first time? And will there ever be an effective cure? How often do you hear that question? And this question is mine. It's a question that I ask of myself. And when I come home many nights after what seems like an endless day of nobody seeming to improve, I, ask, I say to my wife, I just don't get it. Why do so many of our patients stick with us despite our inability to truly help them? And that brings me to the, to coming too close to the end. How can we disable migraine? And I think we can do it in a number of ways. We can do it by changing misconceptions, by getting the word out through this public awareness campaign that migraine is a real neurologic disease. And we can do this building on what we already know, plus what we will know moving forward in the future, using neurobiological, imaging, genetic and epigenetic insights. And we can do this by educating the public as well as the others in the healthcare community. We can do it by changing attitudes of the public, of our patients, of their families who all too often don't seem to get it, of, the co of their coworkers, of their caregivers, of our funding sources, and unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to say this, but of our colleagues as well, who also don't seem more often than not to get it. And we can do it by taking the lead. We can do it by working together. So here is my call to action. You knew in two years that I couldn't end any of my conversations with you without a call to action. You know, I sat in this darkened auditorium for the last two and a half or three days wondering what it's like to be outside in San Diego. And I listened to wonderful lectures and I heard in great insights into what's coming down the highway. And I listened to elegant lectures about research. And it struck me once again that we have the best minds in migraine right here in our family. We don't need to go elsewhere. They're all here within the organization. And as I look out here, and as I looked out over the last few days, I saw a collection of clinicians, clinician scientists and, and bench researchers. And I asked, if we don't do it, who is gonna do it, honestly? And I don't care if you address this disease a patient at a time, a clinical study at a time, or a molecule at a time. Are we not all in this for the same reason? The very reason, the, the, the mission statement of the American Headache Society, to improve the lives of headache sufferers. Several slides ago, I talked about loss of control, how healthcare has evolved and we're not in control anymore. Here is an area where we actually have the ability to control our own destiny. We can make a difference by changing perceptions, by getting the word out, by working, and, and, and by working and supporting the American Migraine Foundation. And I don't care how you do it. 
I don't care if you donate your time, if you donate your money, if you donate your voice, but do something. This is a volunteer organization. We all depend on you. And without all of us working together, we're not going to affect any change. Do you want to change the funding graph? You can do it by getting your voice heard, by getting your patients' voices heard. You know, about a decade ago, I was in a board meeting where I heard David Doden first proposed the idea of starting the American Migraine Foundation <clears throat> and the benefits we'd all see from a registry and a bio repository. And I've watched this grow from just an idea to where we are today, where we have a, we have a committee, the American Migraine Foundation, and we have education, and we have the, 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 the push to get academic centers. And I watched in, over the last two years as it just flourished. And I, and I watched in awe as he tells us that 50 patients are now enrolled in the registry. This is going to be our future. This is how we are going to make a difference. But we all have to do it together. And I would be foolish. There's over a, a thousand of you in this organization. I realize I would be foolish and say, don't open your wallets. Don't give money. I would never say that. <laughs> Feel free to donate to the foundation. If a thousand of you gave a hundred dollars or more, that's really great. But rather than open your wallets, I would much prefer if you opened your mouths and used your voices and advocate. Because if a thousand of you spoke to a hundred or two hundred of your patients and they all gave a hundred or two hundred or five hundred dollars, think how much further along we could be and how quickly we can get the data that we need. But you have to do it. You have to do it, and we have to do it together. You know, <clears throat> I, 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 I won't go there. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be just here. Work through your patience. <laughs> work through advocacy. You know, Bob Shapiro and Bill Young work tirelessly to try and get legislative changes for us. But help them. Attend Headache on the Hill. Support AMA and the other patient organizations. With a cohesive voice, we will all make a difference, and we all can make a difference. So I asked the question, how long ago, my question, why do our patients keep coming back despite the fact that we're not doing anything? And I think the answer should be pretty obvious, because we offer them something that most of the other people that they've seen haven't. We offer them hope, and they know that their best chance of finding relief and having ultimate success is through working with us, not against us. And, and it's interesting because when, when you advocate for the foundation, it's a really easy discussion to have with the patient. They want to help us because they know ultimately we're going to help them. I have never had a patient say no when I discuss support for the, for the foundation. They may give a dollar or two. Several of them have given several thousand dollars, but none of them have ever said no. All you have to do is ask. And I'm asking you to ask. <laughs> we have to do it for the Stevens and the Ashleys and the Robs and the millions others like them so we can take them out of the darkness and give them their lives back. I need to do it for him. And I implore you, if we work together, we can disable this together. Thank you.